Thank you so much for coming to lunch at the library at Bennett Martin today. Um, we do it the first Wednesday of the month. We have a great speaker lined up for you today, but I do want to mention our last one of the year is going to be December 6th, the first Wednesday of December. And Melissa Homestead will be here, and her book is The Only Wonderful Things, The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis. So that will be another good one to mark your calendars for. Then we take a break in December and January, and we'll start up again in February with some um, great authors for you to come and share your lunch with us. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our author today. We're real excited to have Matt Steinhausen here. Hello. I think he knows a bunch of you folks. Or you probably know about him. He's been all over the place, but we're, you're going to have some fun um, discussions today. But just real quick, what I have is Matt is a sixth generation rural Nebraskan who refuses to learn how to use a smartphone and has never had a cup of coffee. So, <laughs> He spends his free time exploring the back roads of his home state with a camera. You're going to see that today. He put 30 years of his Nebraska photos into a 234-page, tongue-in-cheek coffee table book called The Least Interesting Place. It features images, stories, and anecdotes from the perspective of a rural Nebraskan. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. And thanks again for coming. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm honored to be here, and I want to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association and Lincoln City Libraries for hosting this event and inviting me to be here, and also for bringing me some food. <laughs> I also want to thank Leslie, who just introduced me. Uh, if you don't know, Leslie operates Francie, Francie and Finch Bookshop at uh, right just a block to the west of here. A block, two blocks? I, I, around the corner. And uh, the reason I'm so thankful for Leslie is because she's a supporter of readers, writers, and publishers. And she puts a lot of effort into getting the, uh, the works of local authors out there. And it's thanks to Leslie that uh, I got a lot of publicity for my book. And it's partly thanks to Leslie that I'm here today. So thank you, Leslie. And thanks for all you do for the literary community. Now, can you all hear me OK? Because I can speak louder if needed. I also brought a hat if the glare is bothering you back there. Um, you know, I'm especially thankful for this opportunity because I love to talk. So I'm going to enjoy this as much as you are, or more, I'm sure. Another thing I love is I love Nebraska. I, uh, when I read books, I read books about Nebraska, nonfiction books about Nebraska by Nebraska authors. I take my vacations in Nebraska and I photograph Nebraska. In fact, I can't remember the last time I was outside of the borders of Nebraska. It's been the better part of a, a decade, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So I'm a bit of a homebody. My friends have made fun of me for my homebody lifestyle, but I uh, tell them that uh, it's not that I'm not adventurous, because after all, what's more adventurous than vacationing in the place that other people avoid when they go on their vacations? <laughs> so I put my love of Nebraska into a book, and that book's titled The Least Interesting Place. And that's a, a tongue-in-cheek kind of title, because it's a place that I actually love. And I love the fact that other people don't find it very interesting. As Leslie told you earlier, I'm a sixth generation Nebraskan. And I'm not just sixth generation on one branch of my family tree. I'm sixth or fifth generation on most branches of my family tree. So my roots run very deep in Nebraska. I grew up in the old, dirty, drafty, farmhouses of my ancestors, uh, both in uh, southern Lancaster County on my paternal family farm and in western Cass County uh, near Waverly on my maternal family farm. Farm life for me was, was boring um, because we didn't have too many guests uh, or visitors and I didn't have too many opportunities to talk. <laughs> but uh, when I was a teenager, I begged and pleaded for a camera. And 
I eventually got a camera, a Nikon 35 millimeter camera. And that made my loneliness go away because suddenly I had a companion, a partner to go out by the creek or into the trees with me and where I could take photos and then share those photos with others. I was so enthusiastic about photography that I built my own darkroom in my 20s. And so then I was able to take photos and develop my own photos. Professionally, I'm not a photographer. I don't get paid to do photography. Uh, my profession is I'm a, a home inspector and a commercial property inspector. And I inspect properties for people looking to buy homes or commercial properties. As I say jokingly, my job is to upset real estate agents. <laughs> While I was in college, I attended uh, Nebraska Wesleyan for one year, and I test, uh, attended the University of Nebraska for a number of years after that, uh, where I received a degree in engineering. And as while I was in college, I met my, uh, my wife, Kim, Kim Dozler. And Kim grew up on a farm in Antelope County, in the house of her ancestors, a, a dusty, drafty old house. And I think Kim's upbringing has made us very compatible because we both appreciate and tolerate rural life. And today, Kim and I, for the last 23 years, have lived in our own dusty, drafty <laughs> farmhouse where we raise our own children. And we've lived there for 23 years and, and our children are now adults. And on that farm, I, there are a number of barns and critters and farm implements decorating the farmyard. And all of those things have been my muses of my photography. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of inspiration to take photos when you live on an old farm with critters around. And uh, we have a beautiful view of the horizon too, which is conducive to sunrises and sunsets and, and storm photos. And we have a lot of critters, all the, the, the chickens and cats and goats and ponies and calves. And all the animals kind of cohabitate, which creates another neat photo opportunity. So my acreage uh, living has, has been very conducive to my hobby of photography. A couple of times a year, Kim and I and the kids would load up the car and we'd drive up to Antelope County to visit the in-laws, to visit Kim's parents on their farm. And a lot of the photos that made it into this book are on those meandering drives. I always drive with a camera at my side, and if I see something interesting, I'll pull off on the next gravel road and drive around uh, to, to take a photo of those old abandoned barns or houses or farmsteads or cowboy boots on fence posts. It was on those journeys, uh, one of those journeys, that I took the, the, the photo that's on the cover of the book. Uh, the story behind that is when we'd get to my in-law's house, my father-in-law, Butch, uh, would often uh, offer me to go for a ride in his pickup, and I'd bring my camera, and we'd visit neighborhood farmsteads and small towns and churches and cemeteries, and I'd take photos, and he'd tell me stories about the places. And the place on the cover of this book, the house, the story he told me about that house is that uh, the locals all called it the rat farm or the rat house. And it wasn't because the family who lived there had the last name of a rat. It was because rats got into their granary and ate their seed and feed, uh, which took away the provisions they needed to get through the next year of farming. And so they were forced to leave that house and it's been abandoned since. Um, one of the other incentives, I think, behind them leaving that house is it was on a hill in the middle of nowhere, and there were no public roads within about a mile of the place. And I imagine they had to have been pretty lonely and pretty windblown, because today, if you'd visit the same site as the, the location of that house, I don't know if you can see it here. If you visit this site today, the house is blown over and there's wind turbines all around it because those wind turbines are capturing the energy from those constant winds of that area. An interesting thing about the cover of this book, I, I'd mentioned that it was about a mile or more from the nearest public road, but 
despite that, you'd be surprised at how many people have come up to me and say, oh, I, I know that place, or I, I remember that house. Well, th they don't. They haven't seen that house, but, but it's a house that reminds people of another abandoned house they've seen at some point in their lives. And that's one of the cool parts about this book, and one of the things that was important to me is I wanted to create a kind of an air of familiarity, something that uh, when people looked at the book, they'd feel a sense of home or a sense of familiarity. And I think that gives us comfort. And that's something that I was, I was striving for. When I put it together, in fact, when I, when I decided what pictures and what to write, I, I, the thing on my mind was, will this make people happy? Will it make them feel good about themselves? Will it bring joy? And uh, that was, so that was my goal, putting this all together. You might be asking, so what made you decide to write a book? Well, uh, about 12 or more years ago, I got on social media and I started sharing my pictures on Facebook and people started commenting on them and saying things like, well, you should build a calendar or write a book. And I took them up on it. Yeah, those suggestions planted the seeds that grew into this. Um, I didn't know what I was doing though. And I think I'm gonna, here's, I'm gonna give you a little background on me. I, I attended college and the last English class I took, I got a D plus. I, I, I avoided literature except for the uh, sports page back in my teens and 20s. But as I aged and matured, I, I became more passionate about reading and writing too. And I think it's a lesson that we can change as we grow because uh, I will assure you that the teachers I had 30 some years ago would have never believed that I'd be standing here and talking about being an author of a book in front of you people. One feather in my literary cap though, and I, and I, I, I never pass up an opportunity to brag this one up. Uh, when I was a freshman in college, I went to Wesleyan, and I had an English class with William Clefcorn, the former state poet laureate. And uh, in our final project of the semester, he gave us the opportunity to write in any style that we'd learned that year. And uh, one of the styles we learned was poetry. So I wrote a poem because I wanted to be judged by the best. And I got a B plus. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I've always been honored by that. And I, I, Bill Clefcorn was a great guy and a great Nebraskan, but I think it's important to note that he was born in Kansas. <laughs> so you might be asking, why did you come up with the title, The Least Interesting Place? And, and the fact of the matter is, I didn't have a theme when I started writing a book. I didn't know what I was going to be, you know. Nebraska pictures. I, I had no idea, but I read an article in the Journal Star once about a marketing firm who'd been studying uh, places that people are interested in traveling to, and they had determined, four years in a row, they had determined that Nebraska ranked 50th out of 50 when it came to states uh, where people were interested in traveling. And that sparked a light bulb in my brain, and I thought the least interesting place because I think, and I've always thought, that Nebraska should embrace all of the things we don't have. And that's a lot of tourists and amusement parks and power lines. So um, that's, that's how I came up with the title. And uh, I was pretty proud of myself. But not long after I came up with that title, the Nebraska Tourism Department announced their campaign, honestly, it's not for everyone. I was so, I, I was shocked and hurt because I felt it compromised the originality of my idea. I was also angry because they hired a marketing firm from Colorado and paid them a lot of money to come up with that self-deprecating uh, description. So I shelved the project. This book was done. Until early 2020. And you guys might remember what happened. We kind of got stuck in our houses. I'd also been asked to decorate a physician's office with my photography. And so it forced me to go through 20 plus years of my photography. 
of my photos and choose a couple hundred of the best ones. And through that process, I, I was re-inspired to put this book together. So the next step was I needed a publisher. So I went to University of Nebraska Press because they were a natural fit. I read books published by the University of Nebraska Press. I am a Nebraskan who graduated from the University of Nebraska, and I wrote a book about Nebraska. And I was rejected. There is no mo better motivation than rejection. And I spent the next two months working 12 hours a day making sure that the people from the University of Nebraska Press would wish they wouldn't have rejected me. Now, I don't think that's the case, but I, I convinced myself of it, and that really motivated me. So during the pandemic, I worked side by side with my wife while she was working from home, and I was working from home, and our internet was so poor in our old drafty, dusty farmhouse, I was going through an old phone line, and uh, we had to be next to the modem and plugged into it to make our computers work. So we were literally elbow to elbow for six months while I put this book together. But being next to someone else who's working and clicking on that keyboard is kind of motivating because she didn't take breaks and I didn't take breaks and we motivated each other. And it was a lot of fun. And it was a great uh, opportunity for us to work together because normally she'd been going into an office. So uh, we, uh, we got to work together and we got to learn how to tolerate each other even more. After I got rejected and put this book together, the next step of the book writing process, has anyone here ever written a book? There's one. Anybody else? Am I missing? Right back here and here. Well, you might know how this goes, and it's not an easy process. There's a lot of self-doubt along the way. But I, uh, I needed an editor uh, because I didn't have a publisher who was going to be doing it for me. Uh, but thanks to my, my business as a home inspector, I've made a lot of connections with people who are my clients. And one of those clients uh, was a person named Kate, who uh, is now the director of, the, of Nebraska's Legislative Information Office. And what that means is that she's really good with words. And I knew she'd be a perfect editor for me. But she'd never edited a book, to my knowledge, so I goaded her into taking on the project by telling her how awful my writing was and uh, ensuring her she'd be miserable trying to straighten it out. She couldn't say no out of a sense of mercy and perhaps out of a, <laughs> a perverse sense of curiosity just to see how bad my writing was. But Kate, uh, she did something better than any editor could do. She made suggestions on how to improve my writing without crushing my ego. And she didn't actually edit my book. She just said the things that I could do better and pointed out she did some proofreading too. As a consequence of her work, I think when you read this book, you hear my voice. And I'm very thankful for all the things Kate's done for me. And I, it's also important to note, she's very modest, so she probably wouldn't appreciate me talking about her. But she's been woefully undercompensated. Uh, she wouldn't take money, so it, it's, uh, I've had to give her books and gift cards and those kinds of things. And to this day, I, I've never compensated her fully. The next step in the book writing process, after getting it uh, completed and edited, is finding a printer. And remember, I didn't have a publisher, and I certainly didn't have a printer. So I started looking around for printers, and then another conversation with a former inspection client and friend uh, named Brian, he referred me to a friend of his named Martin Pugh. And Martin's in attendance here today. Martin, would you raise your hand? Thank you. Martin is with Marathon Press of Norfolk. And fortunately, Martin lives in Lincoln, but he makes a trek up to Norfolk occasionally to, to uh, He's kind of their eyes and ears in Lincoln and a representative here in town that, that goes up there. And it, that made it very convenient for me because I could give my projects to Martin. He could go up, get a proof printed and bring it down here and show it to me. And I couldn't have been happier to have a printing company print this book by a Nebraskan, edited by a Nebraskan, 
written about Nebraska and printed in Nebraska. So Norfolk Press was perfect, and, and they really uh, went out of their way for me to create uh, exactly what I wanted. Uh, and, and Martin has been my right-hand man, and I want to give him a lot of credit for all the help he's, he's given me. It's been a fun relationship, and I'm, I'm happy to call him a, uh, proud to call him a friend. So, we got the books printed, and it was the end of mid, mid to late 2020. And recall, the pandemic was still pretty, we were shut down at the time. And I didn't have any plan for marketing or distribution. I had no plan, but I had a ton of books in the back of my truck. And on my way back home to Lincoln from Norfolk, I stopped by Bone Creek Museum in David City because they're an agrarian museum of art. And I was inspired by a lot of the art I saw there. And so I stopped at the museum and I went to their, their little office they have there in gift shop and I brought my book in and asked if they'd be willing to sell it. And they said, no, we only sell the works of exhibitors. So my first, so you can imagine the rejection. I'm feeling I, I, I lost, I didn't get a publisher. The first place I go to sell my book where I'm convinced it's a perfect fit, they turned me down. But I left a book behind on the counter for the people in the gift shop to read. And I also wanted the curator of the museum to see the book because she'd written a book that I was a fan of about Dale Nichols, uh, who's a great artist and also a, an artist who painted the same kinds of things I try to photograph. So that book sat on the counter of the gift shop and the day or two later, I got a phone call from Bowden Creek Museum that said next time you're in town, bring about five books because we sold five of your books just sitting here on the countertop. <laughs> and from that, uh, even though I wasn't an exhibitor, but they made me an exhibitor. So uh, the next summer, I had a photo exhibition at Bone Creek Museum. And it, it, it was such an honor and it, that I went from being a, a non-author, hobbyist photographer to having an exhibition at a museum that, that was one of my favorite museums around. So it's been a, it's, this whole experience has been qu quite a whirlwind for me. I'm often accused of being unconventional. Leslie mentioned I'd never had a cup of coffee or, or uh, used a smartphone. In fact, I got my flip phone here and I forgot to turn the volume down there. I'm, sure, I'm glad no one's called. <laughs> so uh, marketing the book, uh, one of my goals was to, well, I'm going to take advantage of my unconventional uh, style. And so we had some pretty unconventional sales. And one of the first things we did was uh, when I got home with this truckload of books, I had a book signing party in my driveway because we were still, everything was social distanced. But an outside book signing event was, was, was perfect. So we opened up our farm and invited people out. And uh, people came and bought books, and, and I signed them and personalized them. And then I got them into... I met Leslie at Francie and Finch. I met Carla and Tori at Chapters Books and Gifts in Seward. Uh, I met the people at From Nebraska, and they were all very happy to sell my books, and, and that helped a lot. But then I went via some unconventional routes on book sales. I sold my books at Roca Tavern in Roca, Nebraska. The Fort, the Fort, uh, Fort Western, the, the Western clothing and, and you know, for the fort. I sold them at uh, Byers Cork and Bottle at 13th and South Street, and uh, also at Rockbrook Camera. And all, between all these places, we sold quite a few books. In fact, we sold so many that there was a point in time where the printer couldn't keep up with the demand. So the question I get asked by people brave enough to ask, so how'd you do? How'd it work out? Did you make any money? And the answer is, I did. I actually made a small profit. But if you were to add up all the hours I put into it, it would only be pennies on the hour. But still, breaking even on a project like this is a, is a is pretty good deal. Most self-published authors don't make money. It's usually a project that loses money. So I'm thankful for all of those people that helped me break even and even 
put a few pennies in my pocket at the end. I think part of the reason I was able to break even or make a little money is because it was the perfect storm. My book got printed uh, during the pandemic and we were all realizing we weren't gonna be able to get together with our families for Thanksgiving. And that our cousins and sisters and brothers and, and other relatives out of state weren't gonna be coming to visit us for Christmas. And so people started buying my books for gifts. And also we were stuck in our homes. We needed to be entertained. And uh, the book gave us a little window outside of our window. Uh, and as a part of my unconventional gimmick that went along with shipping books, I started shipping them wrapped in Runza wrappers <laughs> in Valentino's pizza boxes. So you can imagine me walking into the post office with a bunch of Valentino's pizza boxes. Or you can imagine living in Arizona having been from Nebraska and getting home and finding a Valentino's pizza box in your mailbox or on your front door. The comment I get from people who've received my books in, in, that have been shipped is, uh, I appreciate the book, but now I'm hungry for Nebraska food. <laughs> One of the, 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 the methods of putting this book together Tools can be used in good and bad ways, and social media is often used in a very negative way, but I try to use social media in a constructive way. And I used social media, my friends and, and other uh, followers, as a test audience or focus group to help me decide what to write about or what pictures to put in the book. And so that was another one of the, that's uh, a half hour, I'll be taking questions in a little bit. But anyway, uh, I, used, uh, I used social media constructively to help give me ideas about what to write about. And in fact, I used social media to ask my friends what I should talk about today. And one of those suggestions was to talk about the pizza boxes and sending books to friends and family who were overseas or out of state and couldn't, get in, couldn't be here to celebrate with us during the pandemic. In fact, the books have gone all the way to Germany and Belgium and New Zealand and France. Um, one other question I was asked by a, a, a friend of mine was, why aren't there more photos of families and people? Like Solomon Butcher, when he'd go out into the sand hills, he'd take pictures of, of people and their homes. And that's just not my style. I'm not a professional photographer. I don't like taking photos of people, certainly photos of people that are posing. Um, it's much easier to take a photo of an abandoned house. They're not going to complain about how they look. Uh, so that's why there's not a whole lot of photos of people in here. Most of the people in this book are, are my kids and my wife and, and a few random photos of other people here and there. But otherwise, it's, it's, mostly, uh, it's mostly an exhibition of the sparseness of, of portions of Nebraska, which I love. Well, I think uh, I've talked for 30 minutes so far, and I've enjoyed it. Uh, but I'm going to open up the floor to questions if anybody has any questions for me. Yes. I'm surprised you didn't populate your speech um, with examples of your photography. I would have loved to have seen some of your shots. That's a great point, and I thought about that. And I'll tell you why I didn't. I was afraid that it would distract from the flow, and also I was afraid I'm going to tell you a little bit about the unconventional me. I don't use a smartphone. Another thing I don't do is I don't look at photos on smartphones. Because whenever someone gets out their smartphone and starts scrolling through the pictures, the conversation kind of stops. And so I didn't want to do that. Now, it might have been a mistake on my part. But I also thought that by not showing the photos, it would make you folks curious to page through the book. <laughs> And so I brought some books here if you guys want to page through them. In fact, you want to page through it? OK. <laughs> right on. So I got books here uh, to page through. And I, I brought a bunch of extra books, too, if anybody wants to buy one or page through it. Sir, you had a question back here. Yeah. I want to 
no, you went to UNL. What kind of engineering did you study? The question is, what kind of engineering degree did I get? I received a construction management degree, and I was the last graduate from the construction management department that could still use that degree to become a professional engineer. Because subsequent to my graduation, if you got a construction management degree, you were no longer uh, eligible to become a professional engineer with that degree. So, and that was in 1994 that I graduated with the construction management degree. Yes? Matt, I happen to know that you are working on another book. Is this true? No. <laughs> I'm working on multiple books. So thanks to Martin Pugh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Martin with the printer came up with this idea to make postcard books. So we made postcard books with 14 postcards in each book. And that's been kind of a fun project that we've done. So you can rip pictures out of these books and send postcards. Or you can keep them on the coffee table and just page through them and look at the pictures. One of the other books I've been working on is right here. And uh, this is a proof of a book that I've been working on. It's called, uh, it's titled The Truth If You Can Handle It. And it's by my alter ego, uh, Matthias Yoder. And this is a philosophical book. Uh, it's, it's about truth. And truth and philosophy aren't a really good read. So what I've done is, I've incorporated every page, every other page with a photo and a philosophical quote by Matthias Yoder. They're all original quotes. And the first, uh, the first quote in the book is, uh, if you want to upset someone, tell them a lie. If you want to make an enemy for life, tell them the truth. Matthias Yoder. Anyway, every, this, this book is my outlet for my, my late night ponderings and for all the photos that didn't make it into the least interesting place. But there's another book I'm working on that's, I, I think and I hope, uh, going to outshine all of these. I'm working on a companion book to the least interesting place about Lincoln. And it's titled The Unauthorized Biography of Lincoln, Nebraska. And it's going to be, my goal is to make it similar to the layout and format of this book. But it's going to tell a lot more stories about Lincoln's history. And it's going to tell some of the stories, the, the, maybe the more gossipy, untold stories. The ones that, it's the, I want to make the, each story to be like, do you, you remember Paul Harvey, the rest of the story? I want to start a story and end it with that little hook at the end, like, and now you know the rest of the story. Or a little bit like Ripley's Believe It or Not, because there's a lot of things about Lincoln that make it very unique, that, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, we know it if you're a lifelong Lincolnite, but some of the things we overlook because we've been here. It, 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 and I could talk for another two hours about that. Give us an example. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Did you know the guy that named all of the streets in Lincoln? A guy by the name of August, August Augustus Harvey. He only lived here for a year and a half. But he named all the streets, made the maps of Lincoln, created the trail from Nebraska City to Fort Kearney. He helped the capital commissioners decide where the capital was going to be. He helped write the charter for the University of Nebraska. He did all of this stuff. And no one knows who Augustus Harvey is. Another interesting thing about Augustus Harvey is he was from Nebraska City and was imprisoned when he went out uh, intoxicated in the street and dragged the American flag through the mud because he was mad that a Democrat had, or excuse me, <laughs> I get my parties mixed up because back then the parties were kind of switched around, if you know what I'm saying. He was a Democrat, but he was mad that Abraham Lincoln had become president of the United States, but he was a pro-slavery slavery Democrat which the Democrats were at the time. Another interesting thing, I don't know if anybody knows about this, but the University of Nebraska was considered one of the most elite educational institutions west of the Mississippi River. Um, and 
I could go on and on about that, but uh, that's, that's another unique thing about Lincoln. The Capitol, uh, I don't think most people realize what a unique structure that was at the time it was built. Um, you kind of caught me off guard. I, I, uh, do you guys know the story about uh, Thomas Jefferson Fitzpatrick, the book collector? He had he collected so many books. He was a professor at the university. Jim McKee tells this story. He collected so many books that he had almost 100 ton of books in his house and his neighboring house and in a barn at a family member. And when he died, nobody nobody would take his books. And it turns out he was able to find someone that his estate found someone that would a book collector that that uh, brokered them and. And it turned out his book collection was full of original first print Mormon books, diaries, journals, articles that are worth in the millions of dollars today, cumulatively. Um, that's another interesting thing about Lincoln that very few people know about. And I'm really looking forward to telling that story. Go ahead. Yes. What was your criteria for selecting the pictures for your first book? I picked my favorites first. And then I showed them to friends and family. And then, uh, uh, are you familiar with Innovative Pain and Spine here in town? I gave them a couple hundred books to choose from. Uh, excuse me, a couple hundred photos to choose from because they were looking to decorate their office. And they chose about 50 photos that from, and uh, I figured if it was good enough for them to hang in their office, uh, it was good enough for the book. So if any of you have been to Innovative Pain and Spine out near uh, 56th and, uh, Pine Lake, the office is decorated with my photos. Are there any more questions? Yes? What is it about the state of Nebraska that fascinates me? Ah, what is it about Nebraska that fascinates me? When I was growing up, all my friends couldn't wait to get away from here. And I thought that was weird because I loved it. And I was fascinated about why do I love it and no one else seems to. And I think that's just kind of been my forever in my head. Like, what is it about Nebraska that I enjoy? Is it the people? Is it the scenery? But more than anything, I, I guess I embrace my unconventional lifestyle. And I embrace some of the lack of convention in Nebraska, especially some of the characters you meet in some of these small towns. I love, I love all the contradictions in Nebraska. I'm going to tell you some contradictions. Speaking of, this ties in with our Lincoln thing. You ever notice that Old Cheney Road takes you to Yankee Hill, but Yankee Hill Road takes you to Cheney? <laughs> Have you ever noticed the most unnormal street in Lincoln is called Normal Boulevard? Did you know that there's a Methodist church down here called St. Paul Methodist? But, and it's the first Methodist church in Lincoln, or the, the longest. It's, but first Methodist church is on St. Paul. <laughs> anyway, those are the things. I don't know. I, maybe I just love Nebraska because it's been my home for so long. And as I mentioned earlier, familiarity breeds comfort. And I'm so familiar with it that it's comfortable and heartwarming to me. And so, therefore, I love it. Yes? How do you respond to all the change that comes with growth? Oh, boy. You asked the wrong guy for that. I write books about it to preserve our heritage. I am not a pro-growth person. And so that puts me at odds with a lot of my friends in politics because they are of the belief that we must grow to survive. I'm of the belief that I think we can survive without growing. If we embrace what we have and take care of what we have and we're not as wasteful. I, uh, I, was, I wasn't a real big fan of the skyscraper that's allegedly going in down on 9th Street or the demolition of Pershing. I understand progress is necessary, but. Oftentimes, a few years after we tear down a, a, a building, we realize, oh boy, we could have used that. I wish we could have found a way to preserve that. And I'm a preservation kind of guy. So how I respond to it, I literally write books and take photos because that's my way of saving the past. I also 
preserve old houses and old barns. So uh, I'm a big fan of trying to keep the old stuff around, no matter how dusty and drafty it might be. In fact, uh, some of you might know, I'm restoring an old limestone house that was built before Nebraska was a state down uh, between Sprague and Roca because I just, uh, I can't see to see, I can't stand to see something like that be lost. It's a, it's not healthy, trust me, I, I, trying to save everything. Yes? You just talked about photographing churches. There's an awful lot of beautiful churches in small towns. In fact, uh, there's a chapter in this book dedicated to the spires of, of Nebraska, and the spires being churches and um, the ca government buildings, courthouses. Uh, I really, what I want to do, and this is a, a goal if I ever can retire, I want to go to all 93 counties and photograph courthouses and document some of the stories behind the courthouses, uh, the art in the courthouses and the stories, and I want to document each little prison or holding cell in the courthouses and see what kind of interesting stories go along with them. Now, I was going to title the book 93, because there's 93 counties, but my understanding is some counties share courthouses, so it wouldn't actually be 93, but uh, uh, but anyway, that's uh, that's something I've, I've, I've gone around and taken photos of a lot of churches, and a lot of them are in here, uh, inside and outside, because I find churches fascinating. When I was a kid, I'd walked into a church, and I'd say, wow, God is all around me. And then I got an engineering degree, and I walk into churches, and I say, wow, this must have been challenging to build. <laughs> so uh, I, churches are a fascination of mine. Hey, I think I don't see any more hands in the air. Yes. Uh, I have a daughter-in-law who was uh, raised in northern Minnesota, went to school at the University of Nebraska, uh, North Dakota, and uh, her husband got a job here in Lincoln, and uh, she moved down here. They moved down here, and about the first uh, six to eight, twelve months, I can't remember exactly. She said, I never want to live in uh, Nebraska anymore, period. She did, your, your, your daughter? My daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-law, and she hates Nebraska. No, let me tell you. I haven't <laughs> finished my story. That was about after about 6, 8, 12, 15 months. I can't remember. But anyhow, today, if you talk to the <laughs> it's an acquired taste. It is an acquired taste. Uh, it, I, I agree. I think that I, a lot of people find that. A lot of people, my friends who've moved away, came back because they realized uh, how much they really appreciated it here. One quick thing about this book, and then I'll close out. What was fascinating to me after people started reading it was the one of the most common comments I got was I laughed and I cried. I didn't write anything in there that would intentionally make someone cry. But I think what happened is the book it reminded people of their love of their home state. And that really, it, it really made me feel good about what I did here. And it made me feel good uh, that I was able to share that with other Nebraskans and help them appreciate this place and maybe help them appreciate our, our, our legacy. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. And thanks for coming. This is a great crowd. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, Matt, for uh, sharing your love of Nebraska with everyone here, with all bunch a room of Nebraskans. I am in no way a native of Nebraska, and I've been here less than a year. But it's hearing stories like this that make me proud to be a Nebraskan now and makes me feel like I can call this home. So thank you for sharing that with us. And on behalf of Lincoln City Libraries, on behalf of NLHA, and the Heritage Room of Nebraska authors, I want to thank you for your time and give you a little something for sharing this with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.
You, uh, <laughs> thank you, Amber. <laughs>